I have the unique opportunity of sitting down for an exclusive interview with a trans identifying female who's been a lifelong competitive athlete, an alpine freestyle and cross country skier, a tennis player and a golfer who played on the collegiate and professional levels. I know what you're thinking. I've seen this movie before. I didn't like the ending. Well, this story is different because Nicole Powers has woken up and is vowing to never compete against women ever again because that's the only way to level the playing field. And Nicole Powers joins me now. Nicole, thank you so much for doing this interview and having this conversation. I think these conversations are so important. And I want to get your take on the issue of trans athletes competing in women's sports, because this issue has been dominating headlines. So did you see these headlines and realize maybe I'm part of the problem? Yeah, you know, when I was transitioning and starting my athletic career, you didn't see trans women competing in women's sports because, like, we we all knew that that wasn't the right thing to do. Um, You know, I didn't necessarily see that I was part of the problem because, you know, you're kind of force fed this information that your, your existence is not the problem and, you know, you should enter women's spaces without restraint. Um, And it wasn't until I saw real problems occurring within women's sports that I had to take a step back and and, and realize that biological, you know, biological realities are real and competitive advantages will always exist despite a number of years you've transitioned or whatever surgeries and hormones you've done. And then understood that my place is not in women's sports. So you took to TikTok and you said, you know, I'm going to go to my coaches and tell them that I'm no longer competing against women. What was their reaction? You know, the reaction was almost the same as a lot of these events that I'm competing in is very shocked in the sense of, well, no, 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 like you belong here. And even with me saying, no, I don't they still are continuing to try and force the agenda that you're a trans woman. We're going to continue championing you in women's sports. Like, you know, really have a think about this. Like you, you're a woman, like that's what they're, they're saying. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not a woman. I'm a trans woman. And it's like this bizarro world where now I'm trying to defend my reality against people who are trying to defend something I'm telling them I'm not. So it was shocked. Um, and, and, and definitely, you know, the agenda has has gotten to everybody in the athletic world, including my coaches, trainers, and um, governing bodies of my sports. So are they still going to support you as you compete against men? Some, some have said yes. Um, others have said, you know, I feel like this is a political agenda that I don't want to get behind. And, you know, this is not a political agenda. This is just an agenda of equality and something that I feel must be done to preserve the sanctity of women's sports and understand that, you know, if we want to have this category moving forward in our history, we can't dilute it with unfair competition. It's so interesting because it feels like you're the teacher and they're the students and no one understands the differences, the biological differences between men and women better than trans people. Because if they weren't unhappy in their body originally, they wouldn't want to change to the other one. And if they were the same or if it was, you know, you could just flip flop, there wouldn't be this transition experience. Right. So it's interesting. You mentioned this trans league solution. A lot of people say, well, the answer to this whole problem is just have trans people compete with each other over there. But I don't think there are enough trans athletes for that to be a viable option. However, don't you think that let's say that there is a trans league, it boils down to biology, right? Because the trans uh, females are going to end up dominating the trans males. Yeah. And I want to take a step back and, you know, the the verbiage of trans female is is very misleading. Like I, you, you can't transition to be a female. And I think that people use that term 
um, with, you know, it's, I'm a trans woman, you know, that's, that's what I am. And I, and I've always held fast to the, um, to the belief that a trans league is not the answer because if you are a male, which I am, I belong in men's sports against other males. And even though I have may have taken some, um, let's say D enhancing drugs with hormones, um, that does not then push me into a new biological category. You know, we, I, I think I told you in, in our discussion last week that there are a number of things that athletes do which can de enhance their performance ability. You know, having too much chocolate or, you know, alcohol, it's not, um, it's not any different with, with, with hormones. You know, people make this, this huge assumption and big idea that it magically transforms you into a new gender, which it doesn't. You know, I read things online that are so untrue that it, it shr- you know, even people are under the assumption that it shrinks you. Like none of, you know, none of these things are true. All it does right. is, you know, it, it, it aligns your, your, your mind and it, it then facilitates some secondary sex characteristics, but, which might make you feel a little bit more comfortable in your body. But it doesn't allow you to then compete with the gender that you're not. Well, it's interesting that you say that because there are these governing bodies in the world of sports, whether it's the IOC or NCAA, and they set forth these parameters that say, well, if you have a certain hormone level or if you transition before a certain age, then you can compete on the same level as women. But what you're saying is you transitioned and you didn't feel any different? You didn't experience any changes in in ability? You know, what's interesting is the the hormone level argument is is so misleading because if I'm going to have my blood work done and my hormones checked, if I took, let's say, a double dose of estrogen before going into to this, you know, to this blood draw, I would have extremely high elevated levels of, of hormones. So what's not to say that somebody... Um, would not take any hormones for six months, eight months before the IOC or NCAA steps in to check their levels, you know, doubles up on, on estrogen and magically you're a woman. Like, yeah, you, if you take estrogen right before a, you know, a hormone level check, you know, they tell you not to do, to do it before a day or, or so before because of that elevation in levels. Mm. So it's a very, muddy water. And I think to clear it all is stick with biology. And if you are, you know, if you are a female, um, you must abide by uh, anti-doping policies. I think we talked about this before, you know, trans men, if you're taking testosterone, that is 100% a a performance enhancer. So, um, you know, you would then have to abide by those, those laws that have been in, in place for a long time. But if you are a trans woman, um, you belong in men's sports despite hormone level, you know, and when I was uh, first on my athletic journey in uh, college and professional, I would read through those guidelines and and think to myself, oh, um, you know, and check off these boxes. I've been on hormones for five years. Oh, you know, I've been on this. I have that surgery. I've, I'm, I'm good to go. And, you know, and and. And they made me think I was, well, I I should be welcomed there. I had to do my own research to understand that I'm not. Wow. And have you received any awards or scholarships while you were playing in women's divisions? I received no awards or scholarships in the women's category of of sports, but I did, you know, compete professionally in in women's golf um, and I I had I haven't made this video yet, but I was thinking about talking about, you know, during those competitions, I would purposefully kind of lay off a little bit on my on my game, like, you know, kind of hit. The, I, I didn't want to raise any flags, you know, so if I'm standing on the tee box with three other women, I'm um, I'm, I'm not going to just bomb a drive out there on the fairway, uh, you know, 310, 315 yards, even though I, I knew I could, despite, you know, my lifelong transition or, you know, transition for 10 plus years, I knew that I could do that. But instead, I would, I would maybe club down, lay off a little bit on on my game, because I didn't want to raise those flags. Interesting. And 
you know, with the game of golf, there are different tees. You know, ladies usually hit from the red tees and then there's white tees and, you know, so on and so forth. But those tees represent differences in ability, right? And and how far you can drive. So when you were playing on the professional level, were you, you were all teeing off in the same tee box, I assume. Yeah. So, you know, women's professional golf, um, it's it doesn't equate to the ladies' tees at like a, a normal golf course. You know, it's still a, a pretty far course, but at least 500, 600 yards shorter than the men's the men's game. So there is right. a very drastic difference between the women's distance versus the men's difference. Um, and, and like I said, I felt like I had to lay off a little bit because I'm somebody who, who doesn't want to, you know, raise flags. And in the back of my head, this entire, um, couple years that I was playing in professional tournaments, I'm like, you know, I wouldn't feel like, I knew I wouldn't feel right if I did take awards. Um, so it was almost a sense of, okay, like, you know, it's, it's a belonging thing. And then, you know, you have to be comfortable in yourself to understand that you can belong any, like you can belong and be yourself and, you know, play, uh, play fairly. Um, So I think it was more of a self-discovery and a self-journey for me. So what's your reaction to Haley Davidson, who is in the qualifying (laughs) stage for the LPGA, a -hmm. man transitioning to be a woman? Um... To me, it seems like this is a man fully taking a spot away from a well-deserving woman. Um, What do you think that these governing bodies and different leagues need to do to ensure fairness and to ensure the safety of women's sports? (laughs) Chromosome tests. I don't know. Like, you know, in in what's what's interesting is, um, you know, there are a lot of states in our nation that you can change your birth certificate to show uh, a sex that you are not, to show a gender that you've transitioned to, um, which is bizarre to me. You know, that is your, your, your birth. And now there are states where you can, you can change your name and, and, and marker to show female um, if you're not on your birth certificate. So it's, it's, I, I don't know what the governing bodies need to do, but they need to listen to women athletes, you know, women, adult human females, they need to listen to those athletes, listen to their pain points and understand that there has to have, there has to be a change. There, there has to be, you know, a clear line in the sand. And it's not, it's not from a position of discrimination at all. It's, it's just from a position of fairness and, you know, from the original reason why we have women's sports and men's sports. Well, you were talking about fairness and listening to females, right? And we're seeing the exact opposite play out with San Jose State University's women's volleyball team and the NCAA because four schools have now forfeited games against the team because of a trans athlete, Blair Fleming. And it's interesting because... Nevada was the most recent team where the, the the girls on the team voted to forfeit the match. And the school came out and had a statement that said, well, that doesn't really go in line with our policies. And we, we're a public university and a state university, so we can't discriminate. So in this case, we have a school just abiding by the laws on the book but completely ignoring all of the feelings of the students that are at the school. And I'm sure they don't feel protected at all. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I was um, definitely applauding the girls on the Nevada team, the Boise team, the Utah team, all of the teams who have done this, you know, the the boycott as Riley Gaines and a lot of the other um, advocates in this area are, are, are calling it. Um, but Nevada and in universities, we all know are are influenced by the the large agenda, and um, they don't want you know their hands on it. But I did read in that statement that the athletes themselves would not be punished for sitting out the game. You know, I don't know how you would punish an athlete for choosing not to play a game. Um, but but still, that statement is it it, it runs very strong in my head that the the large corporations universities bodies 
don't want to see this happen. They want to see this full push and full inclusion at all costs. Right. I want to get into your personal story because you started your transition at the age of 14. And it's not every day that a conservative gets to sit down with a transgender person and really try to understand this experience. Because as a woman, I look in the mirror every day, I see a woman, and I don't think about my gender identity because I don't have to. Um, So if you could just explain to me and the audience, like I'm five years old, what does this feeling feel like? I'm, you started your transition when you're 14, but I'm sure these feelings started much younger. Can you explain what that's like? Yeah, I, I think that it's definitely a feeling of not being at home um, in your outward appearance and the way that the world sees you. Um, you know, I don't remember too much of of five six seven years old other than you know thinking that I would rather be playing with you know girls doing these things in the classroom versus running outside and um you know getting dirty with the boys but then uh when I was 10 11 years old I enjoyed (laughs) running outside and 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 jumping around and getting dirty because that's what I've always liked to do so I think even younger, I was thinking I don't need to change myself just because I don't, you know, my identity doesn't agree with the gender that I was born as. But uh, growing up, it it wasn't this devastating, um, this devastating thing that I think a lot of liberals uh, painted as um, that, you know, it's like a life or death situation, uh, you know, where you if you're a child and you don't agree with your 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 body, you, you need to make these changes now, you know, you need to send five-year-olds and, um, you know, in dresses or, or, or whatever, because they're telling, you know, their parents that they're girls. Um, you know, I don't think anything really should be done until you have a fully formed brain. That wasn't my case, obviously. So I'm not trying to say, well, I did it, but you can't do it. But it wasn't until high school, um, that I started feeling more intense, um, just sort of unwelcomed feelings in my body and the way that the the school or the world saw me. So um, my parents created a very welcoming environment for me to talk to them about what was going on in my life. I told them, you know, this is a conservative family. Um, they they didn't understand. It wasn't a uh, it wasn't from a position of well, you no, know, this is not going to happen. But um, it's like okay, well, let's find the help that you need. Um, so it was therapy for two years. Um, It was therapy for a a year and a half, actually, where, you know, we need to confirm and make sure that what, and it wasn't like I was working towards the goal of puberty blockers. Like I didn't have that, that goal in mind. My goal was just to be myself and be happy. So I had to think um, it out with, with, in therapy that like, you know, this is, this is who I am. This is, you know, what I want to do the rest of my life. And, and again, that carrot wasn't dangling in front of me as a child that, you know, if I say all the right things in therapy, I'm going to get these magical beans at the end of it, where it's going to turn me into, you know, a girl or a woman. Right. And when you were in therapy, did they, were your therapists and the people you were talking to surrounding with, were they pushing the puberty blockers on you or was this just part of the process? Yeah, there, you know, this was, um, 15 years ago. So it wasn't a, it, it was, I'm, I'm sure nowadays they, they are, but um, then it really was about, uh, about the health of the child and, you know, trying to make sure that they're making the right decisions. I think I mentioned to you that, you know, we had to travel to South Florida, to Toronto, because this wasn't a regular thing. Like there wasn't a lot of um, trans youth. I mean, I, I was maybe, just a handful in the country. And now you look around and every school has a group or a club and, um, and everything else. So, you know, this is a one in a million type situation. This isn't the natural progression of, of, of your life. Like, you know, being trans is not natural. It's not normal. Um, it, and it, it's, a, it's a very rare thing. It's been that way for, you know, since the dawn of existence, um, so, you know, the fad of transness 
is going to damage a lot of a lot of children. Um, and you know, they really need to go back to to ways of of longer therapy. Yeah. Um, and and also we need to remove the agenda that this is right, this is cool, this is natural. Um, because it's not, it's hard and it's it's not the 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 right thing to you know it's not what your body is 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 wanting or um it's not the, the natural progression of of and your it's, life it's hard to reverse so yeah. this has become somewhat of a social contagion when it comes to children i feel like because they're being sold this bill of goods like you can be a man if you're a woman and vice versa when you know that that's not true you it a boob job doesn't make you a woman right a um, hormones don't just make you a woman. It's, it's more than that. And back in 2020, the NIH did a study that said there are more male to female transitions than there are female to male. And the ratio at that point was about two to one. And now I think it's almost three to one. I think it's 2.7 to one. So what do you attribute this uptick in transgender surgeries and transitions in general? And why do you think it's more commonly male to female? I mean, look around at every media outlet and cartoon and, you know, the big D Disney. I mean, you know, these are, these are industries that are, that are profiting off of youth confusion. I think I attribute it to um, teachers, uh, and I attribute it to role models, you know, like someone had asked me, like, what are your five-year, 10-year plans with what you're doing? Are you going to go to schools? And like, no, I don't, I don't want to be another, uh, fig they have enough trans people they're, they're hearing from. I'd rather talk to parents and, and, and do advocacy, uh, that way. But, but kids are seeing transness and, um, and, I think, you know, transgender uh, just e everywhere. And and that's what's kind of continuing to confuse kids. Now, when it comes to um, boys to girls and men to women, I, I don't know. Like, this is not my my area of expertise. I would just say that um, it's everywhere, like shows, cartoons, um, teachers. Yeah, certainly. And when yeah. you were in this therapy process and in this transition process, do you feel like you were old enough to make this decision? Do you think that they were transparent enough with you about the risks, you know, the medical risks? Did they ask you maybe, do you want to have children one day? Did they make you aware of any of these things? Yeah, of course they did. Um, and I think I mentioned to you earlier that this is this is not something that I could process then. Uh, you know, I'm barely, you're barely ever able to process it at, at, in your twenties. I mean, these are serious things that you're, that you're, that you're trying to decide in your life. Like, you know, being asked, do you want children at 15 years old? Like, do you even know like what that even means? Like, how can you decide something like that? That's going to impact your life for the next 60, 70 years. Right. Um, so I don't remember those specifics. I'm sure that they were asked and, um, and it's, and like I said before, I wasn't trying to search that dangling carrot. I was probably just trying to talk about the things that mattered most to me and having kids at 15, that wasn't really a thought. Like right. I didn't really think about that. I was more interested in, well, I want to be, ex you know, I, I want to feel more accepted at school. Right. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of acceptance, you said that you grew up in a conservative family, with a conservative dad. So what was that like, you know, being a son coming to your dad saying, I don't want to be a boy anymore? <laughs> you know, my dad is my best friend and he was then and he is now. I think that um, obviously telling your dad anything uh, serious is difficult, but that is, um, <laughs> you know, he's not like a macho kind of dude. And, you know, he was a, a tennis player and skier and a baseball player. And, you know, our kind of relationship was built on sports and active, you know, and, and just kind of health and well-being of a, of a moving body. So 
you know, when I when I told him that, um, you know, his first concerns were, well, can I still play? Can we still play golf? And we'll we'll tee off on the same tee box like that. That was actually his concern. Um, but but yeah, it was obviously not not difficult, but I was never scared to come to my parents because, you know, I, it it wasn't um, maybe put out there that they wouldn't accept me. And I think that I see a lot of rhetoric that um, will go to your teachers because your parents don't understand. Well, your parents are the ones who love you more than anybody else ever will. If there's anybody that's going to understand what's best for you, it, it is them. So maybe if they don't think that this is best for you, maybe you should listen to them and and, and then go to next steps. Right. And I feel like there is this rhetoric too coming from the left that says, well, the right is hateful and transphobic and homophobic and bigoted. And that wasn't necessarily your experience with your family, but can you talk about some of the hate that you've received maybe online? I haven't received any hate from the conservative party or the right at all. The only hate and death threats literally that my myself and family have received are all from my own community, which should shock you and, and everybody else because, you know, these are the people who are supposed to stand by you and be your chosen family, I hear all the time, which is, you know, I, I just, I don't understand how the only hate I've ever received is from the left because they don't want my message of reality and in truth getting out there because it will damage whatever agenda they're trying to push. Um, so obviously there are going to be random trolls online and on and in the internet, um, but but none have been valid hate or um, disdain from the right or conservatives at all, ever. I mean, you can, I implore anyone to read through my comments. It's it's all, you know, it's all support and love from, from the right and conservative because they understand that this message needs to be heard. But from the left, you know, it's it's not. It's like, you know, shut up, stop talking. Oh, you're a, you know, a grifter and, and, and this and that. Like, it's it's terrible from from that side of the aisle. Wow. And there's another narrative that's being pushed that, you know, your rights are going to be taken away under Trump, not only trans rights, but women's rights as well. So I get this comment a lot, too, that you're voting against your own interests if you vote for Trump. And I don't know how you're planning to vote in November, but did any of your rights get taken away when Trump was president? No, and I can, and I'm sure that you could probably already, you know, assume who I'm voting for. And I don't really want to be a a political kind of uh, figure, but um, but no, Trump, uh, no rights at all were were taken away. Um, you know, the actual uh, temperature of of society was much lower, even when it came to you know the LGBT population. Like, you know, there wasn't this this kind of discourse going on against trans people under Trump's administration, because we were more focused on making America great. You know, that that's what is so interesting is it wasn't until there was a, a democratic administration that we all started arguing about, um, you know, about trans rights for like, tell me what those are. Right. Number one, because <laughs> if you're an, if you're an adult, um, have at it, you know, get right. tattoos, get surgeries, live your life the way you want to live it. Um, so I don't really know what those trans rights people talk about are, but yeah, the, the temperature was much lower under Trump. Wow. You heard it here first. This transgender female, transgender woman is voting for Trump, not tampon Tim. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having this conversation with me, Nicole, what you're doing is not easy. It's not always easy to do the right thing, but I think a lot of women are going to be thankful for your message and thank you so much for, for speaking out. Thanks for having me.